This is called a Class D amplifier. It's a very popular type of audio amplifier. These days, if you buy anything that plays music, it probably has one of these in it. Whether it's a Bluetooth speaker or a soundbar or even a professional audio system. And the reason we like these things so much is because of their very high efficiency. So you can use them to make lots of noise while still using a relatively small amount of power. That's obviously good if your product is battery powered, but also it means the amplifier doesn't produce as much heat. So you don't need massive heat sinks and cooling fans to prevent it from overheating, which means you can make the product a lot smaller. Now in today's episode, we're going to take a look at how this actually works and how on earth it manages to be so efficient. Now, in order to understand why a Class D amplifier is so efficient, we first need to understand why other types of amplifiers aren't that efficient. So take a look at this circuit right here. So this little circuit is called a Class B amplifier. Sometimes this design is also referred to as a push-pull amplifier for reasons that might become clear later on. So in this circuit, you can see we've got two transistors and a split power supply with the positive at the top of the circuit and the negative side at the bottom of the circuit. Then on the left side, we've got the input, which is where the audio signal comes in. And on the right side, we've got the output, which is where we can connect our speaker to play the sound. Now, the way this circuit works is that these transistors operate kind of like valves that can allow electric current to flow through them, and they get controlled by the audio signal that comes in. So let's say that we have a very simple audio signal coming in that has the shape of a sine wave. Now, when the voltage of that signal starts going up, starts going positive, that opens up the transistor at the top of the circuit, allowing electric current to flow from the positive power supply rail onto the output. Then, when our signal goes negative, that opens up the transistor at the bottom of the circuit, allowing electric current to flow from our output into the negative supply rail. And that copies the input audio signal onto the output. Except, of course, the output signal will be much stronger and capable of driving a big speaker. So this design works really well, but it's not efficient. And the reason it's inefficient is in these transistors. So a transistor that is fully turned on, fully opened up, is very efficient because it allows the electric current to pass through it with very low resistance. So we have very low power dissipation in that transistor. A transistor that is fully turned off or fully closed is also pretty efficient because, well, there is no electric current going through it whatsoever. So that's also, you know, actually that's 100% efficient. So a transistor that is either fully on or fully off can be very efficient. But the problem is a transistor that is sort of somewhere in between, that's not efficient at all. Because if the transistor is, let's say, halfway open, then it's allowing electric current to pass through it but not completely, so it has a high electrical resistance. In other words, we're going to get a high voltage across it, and it's going to dissipate a lot of power and get very hot. And the problem with this circuit is that the transistors spend a lot of time being in that state, right? Because during these parts of the audio signal, the transistors are in that in-between state where they waste a rather significant amount of power. And that makes an amplifier like this very inefficient. The theoretical maximum efficiency of an amplifier like this is about 78%. And in practice, they're usually just around 60%. So you can imagine that's not very good. So how does a Class D amplifier manage to overcome this problem? Well, the secret all lies in what it does to the audio signal right at the beginning. So right as the audio signal goes into the amplifier, we do something to it and that changes everything. And what we do is we convert that analog audio signal into a sequence of pulses, into a square wave signal. Now this can be done using an analog circuit involving a bunch of op amps, but it could also be done using digital electronics, so a microprocessor of some kind. So a Class D amplifier isn't necessarily a digital device. Some people think that it stands for digital, not necessarily, right? This conversion of the analog signal into a, uh, into a square wave signal can be done using fully analog electronics. And it actually happens like that in, in quite a lot of designs. Now, the cool thing about this pulse train 
is that the width of these pulses corresponds to the voltage of the original signal. So all of the information is still in there, but it's just encoded in a different way. Now that pulse train then goes into a power amplifier stage that is actually very similar to the power amplifier stage that we looked at in the previous example. This is a square wave signal, and because it's a square wave, there is only high or low, there is never anything in between, which means if we feed that signal into our power amplifier stage, the transistors are always going to be fully open or fully closed, right? They're just going to be turning on and off as the square wave comes in. And that means these transistors are going to be super efficient because they never spend any time being somewhere in between. They're just either fully opened or fully closed all the time, which means they're operating very efficiently all the time. Now, there will still be some power losses because these transistors still have a little bit of electrical resistance, of course, even if they're fully turned on. And also, there is still a tiny little transition period between the high and low levels of that square wave. So in reality, the transistors still spend a fraction of a second, or, or I should say a fraction of a millisecond, uh, being in that in-between zone. This is usually referred to as switching loss in the world of power electronics. So there is still some minor power losses involved, so you can't quite get to 100% efficiency, but efficiencies of over 90% are easily possible, which is of course a massive improvement over the 60% or like 78% tops that we saw with the Class B amplifier. Finally, we then take that pulse drain and we feed it through a, a passive filter, which is nothing more than a coil and a capacitor, which smooths it back out into an analog audio signal that you can feed into a speaker. And this is how a Class C amplifier manages to get its ridiculously high uh, efficiency. Now, sometimes there is a little bit of debate about whether a Class D amplifier sounds as good as an old school type of amplifier, because in theory, uh, you're losing some information when you convert the analog signal into that square wave uh, pulse train. Um, but the thing is, while in theory you can, you can lose some information in there, in practice you wouldn't notice. And I, I like to compare this to taking a, an image with a digital camera. So, you know, in theory, if I take a picture with my digital camera, I lose information because I convert the real-life image into separate pixels, right? It's like a digital image consists of pixels, whereas an analog camera just projects it directly onto a piece of film. So in theory, an analog image is better because the digital image chops it up. But in practice, if I have enough pixels, I'm never going to be able to tell, right? There are so many of them. If I take a, an image of like 10 megapixels, you know, 10 million pixels, they're way too small for me to see. It just looks perfectly fine. And that's the same thing here, right? Surely, in theory, you'd lose information, you know, converting the analog signal into a, into a, a square wave pulse train. But as long as the carrier frequency of that pulse train is high enough, which is usually the case, you're not going to be able to tell the difference. There is also stories of people that claim that they can tell the difference between like the sound of a class D amplifier and the sound of a, let's say, a class A amplifier. But that's sort of tricky, right? It's tricky because if you're comparing a class D amplifier to a class A or a B amplifier, or whatever, then you're not only comparing a different type or a different class, you're also comparing just different products. And so even if you can tell a difference, which I highly doubt, but maybe you can. How do you know that it's because it's a different type of amplifier and that it's not just because you, you know, it's different products, so they're always going to sound different anyway, right? So it's very difficult to get an apples to apples comparison in that way. Um, but generally speaking, Class D amplifiers sound absolutely fine. There is no noticeable difference whatsoever, but it is way more efficient, which means you can have crazy powerful amplifiers in a super small form factor which is, of course, exactly what you need if you want to build the loudest Bluetooth speaker. So anyway, now hopefully you know a little bit more about Class D amplifiers. I, I hope you've enjoyed this video. Uh, if you do enjoy videos like this, or you know, perhaps some of the other videos that I make every now and then where I build wacky things, uh, then consider subscribing to this channel. Uh, and all that's left for me to say right now is, of course, thank you for watching. <laughs>